and free, you know, said there's a Hitler in Downing Street, don't talk like this, it's stupid and all this. So no one was convinced. But that particular phrase went on. Uh, Milosevic became the Hitler on the Danube. They actually said that. Saddam Hussein, who had been the, an ally of the West for most of his adult political life, ever since he had carried out his CIA instruction to wipe out the communists in Iraq and had done so, he'd been a loyal ally. They broke with him later, after, just after the Cold War, and wanted to punish him, and did so. Uh, and then he suddenly became a Hitler on the Nile. Or, or, uh, on the uh, uh, Tigris. So this image, these images were then replayed. And a senior journalist who supported the Iraq war told me very seriously, he said, oh, yes, I know you will oppose every war by the West. I said, yeah, it's a good principle. <laughs> but he said, I'll tell you what our problem was. Our problem was we could find no images. I said, but you could have found images of uh, the use of gas, killing gas in Halabja in Kurdistan, but the problem was you were supplying the gas. Uh, and at that time, he was your big ally in the Iraq-Iran war, which you provoked because you wanted to teach the Iranians a lesson. And so I guess those images couldn't be brought out and used, I understand, and he wasn't stupid enough to carry out a massacre, even a tiny one, to give you images which you could then use to explain why you were attacking, so you had to lie. And so the changeover in the media became most noticeable, actually, when they went to war. You knew they were going to go to war when suddenly they became interested in a, in a country. I mean, you know, it's a sort of expensive way to teach the American citizens geography. <laughs> but suddenly people who had no idea where Afghanistan was suddenly realized this is a, a tiny country uh, somewhere in the north of Pakistan. Uh, and Pakistan, many think, is part of India anyway, <clears throat> which will come as news to my friends in the BJP. <laughs> uh, but never mind. So Afghanistan they learned about, because that's where the guys were who came and hit us, and we're going to hit them. And I remember debating one of Bush's uh, senior journalist supporters, he's so awful that I've even forgotten his name, um, on Canadian television the week after 9-11. And we were debating the decision to attack Afghanistan. And I said to him, I said, it's nothing. There's nothing you know, ideological about it. It's just a crude war of revenge. And he said, yeah, it is. So what's wrong with that? I said, right. Let's go on to the next question then, because there's no argument. You agree it's a crude war of revenge. Fine. But that's not how it was portrayed. It was portrayed as a fight for women's rights. It would have been the first war where the, which the West had waged for women's rights, by the way. And today, 10 years later, we see the effect of the occupation of Afghanistan on the rights of women. All the women's groups in Afghanistan are saying, get out, you know. The people you've been allied here with are people who have given us a lot of trouble in the past and still are. So. Uh, and when we said to them, and I said this time and time again in the United States, on the counter-cultural media, that this war they are never going to win. The Russians failed. They're going, the British failed before them. The Afghans aren't going to tolerate being occupied, apart from a tiny group. And you're making it even difficult for yourselves there, because this war is going to spill over into Pakistan and create havoc. That's exactly what's happened. Now they're talking about going away. But if you look at the media coverage of the war, total, total, not a single Western newspaper opposed this war. The Iraq war, there was opposition. The Guardian was not in favor of the war. 
and one or two other papers were critical. But Rupert Murdoch's 150 newspapers all over the world, I, I wrote this in Bush in Babylon, that we have a free press and how is it that all of Rupert Murdoch's papers supported the Iraq war in editorial line and propaganda. And I got a very sweet email from someone in Tasmania and Australia saying, you're right, but we are the, in Tasmania, the small Murdoch group paper, which is barely read, they didn't care about us, and our editor published an editorial attacking the war. So I said, well, congratulations. <laughs> but the Iraq war was supported by and large. The uh, German and French, which had op opposed it, the minute Baghdad was occupied and the new regime recognized, switched, and the media now began to support the occupation. And that is another thing worth pondering about, that when you live in a unipolar world where the United States determines everything, or more or less everything, on the global map, how quickly it was after they occupied Iraq before they got the new regime recognized on the Security Council. And you compare that to how long it took to get the representatives of Pol Pot's murderous regime in Cambodia off, out of the UN and the new regime recognized, 12 years. 12 years it took before the United States would agree. But in the case of Iraq, it was just like that. In the case of Afghanistan, it was just like that. No doubt if they succeed in what they're up to in Syria, it will just be just like that. And then you have the contradictions of becoming effectively mouthpieces of your respective foreign offices, which is what the Western media effectively is, again with exceptions, uh, two or three exceptions in Europe, but not more than that. That once you become a mouthpiece of your governments, then you defend something Four years ago, and you have to attack it today because there's no consistency in imperial policies. What serves their interest four years ago and today it becomes different. I give you an example. Muammar Gaddafi of Libya. Once he returned to the fold, in return for which he handed over to Libyans for bombing the Pan Am jet, which everyone at the time said they hadn't bombed, and which is now virtually clear. But he said, let's do it, and they promised they'd release them, but you have to acknowledge it. And pay money to the survivors. Money is always involved. Pay money to the families of the survivors. We'll bring you out of the cold. And they did. He became a statesman. The, you know, if you read the encomiums in the Western media to Gaddafi, quite, quite astonishing. And then Gaddafi of course, uh, paid back in kind. He funded uh, leading institutions in the United States and Britain, the famous London School of Economics. Gaddafi's money poured in, and what they had to do in return was to give his son a PhD, <laughs> which Professor Magna Desai helpfully helped to organize. Sorry, Lord Desai, as he is now, quite appropriately. And they, they wrote this guy's PhD. And one of the supervisors was Anne-Marie Slaughter, the American academic and now an Obama advisor, who was called specially. And she gave it her support. So Saif Gaddafi became Dr. Saif Gaddafi. Based on a PhD thesis he had not written. It had been written for him and approved by other academics in return for Libyan money, which went into millions and millions. And Tony Blair's chief advisor, Anthony Giddens, who was at that time head of the LSE, went to uh, uh, Tripoli, met Gaddafi, looked at this Gaddafi had written a book, or someone had written it for him, called The Little Green Book, filled with homilies and platitudes of the worst order, which you can pick up in any bazaar in Madras or Delhi or something, you know, sort of completely trivial stuff. And Tony Blair's representative said, this is a very important book, 
and we agree with it completely, and we are trying basically to have our own third way, just like yours, uh, President Gaddafi. So Gaddafi said, well, I'm very pleased, Yanni, we're on the same page, you know, good. We can collaborate further. This went on and on. Where Gaddafi annoyed them, because this hasn't been published by and large in the media, which is why I'm telling you, I mean, I write about it, but uh, uh, where Gaddafi annoyed them, that he was quite happy to give money for this and that. What they wanted was an open market. And that beautiful coastline of Libya, they wanted to wreck with the tourist industry. And, and they wanted investments, they wanted to invest in Libyan oil. And here something nagged in the brain of this leader. And he remembered something from his past. And he said, he kept delaying it. He never said no, he kept delaying it. He funded, when the French appealed to him for help or said do an arms deal with us, he said, oh, arms deal we are thinking about, but we'll give some money for Sarkozy's election campaign. A few million were sent off in briefcases, euros, to help the election campaign of Sarkozy. He lost. Uh, <clears throat> this they did. But when this uprising took place, the West thought, here, yeah, this guy's a pain in the so-and-so for us. Let's get rid of him for once and for all. And in they sent NATO. Six months they bombed Libya, which shows that there was some support for this guy. Six months they bombed him, and then they finally got him. And the new government was recognized, and he was killed in the most brutal way possible under a NATO occupation. Now, did anyone report the inconsistencies of supporting him and then treating him like this? Very few people did. Very few people did. There were some good journalists in the American press and in the British press, two or three, who reported it. So where you see the modern Western media at its clearest is when the West goes to war. Or when the West feels its interests are threatened. And now that brings me to the latest phase of this struggle for information. With most of the corporate media basically doing what it foreign offices or governments wanted to do, both on television and uh, in the print media, what became, becomes a new story is when some information which has been repressed is made public. We have in recent years seen two such developments, WikiLeaks and now Snowden. What was WikiLeaks? WikiLeaks was an outfit built by an Australian and his colleagues, Julian Assange, to make information available, where, and not naming their sources or saying where it was coming from, and saying we will, we will do it. And Bradley Manning, a young American soldier in Iraq, is so disgusted by what he's witnessing and the effect of this war on his own fellow soldiers and most importantly, Manning said on the Iraqis, what we were doing to them, that he decides he's a uh, cyber expert in the intelligence wing. He has access to uh, you know, secret cables and documentation. Systematically, he sends all this to WikiLeaks. What do they do? They contact the New York Times, the Guardian, uh, Le Monde and some German paper and say we want to publish and these papers publish but they pick and choose what they want to publish. So they don't publish everything that is there. And then it's a huge storm. But the, the reason for the storm is what? It's that what these documents contain are effectively 
what really goes on behind the scenes and what the United States really thinks. Now, I read very closely the WikiLeaks on uh, Pakistan and I even went through some of them on India and other parts of the world. The intelligence reports sent from Pakistan and the letters of the American ambassador and Patterson as, as it was then, the poor woman who's now ambassador in Egypt and her effigies are being burnt on the streets. Uh, she had sent back actually some very sharp telegrams, <laughs> things she never said in public. She wrote saying the Pakistanis agree with us on the drones, fine, this is where we are doing them. On the drone attacks, we have got support. Uh, Zardari is making a few mistakes, but he does what, he, what we tell him. I mean, it was just stuff everyone knew, but knowing it is not sufficient, because this was giving back up to stuff which had already been written. Chapter and verse, country after country, continent after continent. And this was considered impermissible. And so Bradley Manning was arrested. His trial is taking place even as we speak. And Julian Assange uh, was forced to flee and seek embassy in the Ecuadorian embassy in, in London, where he still is. And while people were recovering from this, something else happened. A 29-year-old kid very effective in his job. Snowden, Edward Snowden, decided that he had had enough. And if you see the 20-minute interview with him on the Guardian website, as, which is produced as a podcast, he strikes you as a very intelligent, thoughtful young guy who went to work for his country, hoping that he would be doing some good, as people do think that. He went to do some good and then first he went to Iraq and uh, was badly injured, but he said he was also disgusted by the anti-Arab racism that he encountered. And he suddenly felt that this was all wrong. Then he came back, he must have kept his doubts to himself. Then he came back and gradually realized what work he was now doing which was spying or helping to spy on large parts of the world. That that's what the National Security Agency in the United States had become, a gigantic spy operation where they had surveillance on all their own citizens and the world. During the British Empire, someone said that imperialism does this abroad so that it doesn't have to do it at home. Now we have a situation where what imperialism does abroad, some of it it is beginning to do at home to its own citizens. That is the impact of the Snowden events. And this kid is now being hunted down. The American media and the British media and some of the European media have started referring to him not as a whistleblower, but as a fugitive, as if he is already a criminal and that they're seeking a criminal. And I hope he gets asylum somewhere in South America uh, because no one else is given, giving it to him. I said in Kerala uh, a f uh, day before yesterday that uh, it's a big tragedy that India, a country with a non-aligned past, which used to be respected once upon a time in most parts of the world, didn't even think twice before rejecting his plea for asylum, not even the courtesy of a polite refusal saying it's awkward for us, it's difficult for us, just an instant reflex. We must not antagonize the new imperial masters. That is effectively what New Delhi did, and not just New Delhi, the whole of Europe. I mean, Evo Morales' plane, the Bolivian president, takes off from Moscow uh, on his way back to Bolivia. They imagine that Edward Snowden is on it. The CIA tells Spain, Italy, Portugal, France not to give him airspace. 
So these great independent states say, don't fly over our country. And then the Austrians carry out an act of privacy, when, uh, piracy. When the plane is forced to land, to refuel, they let it land, but they insist on searching the plane against international law. I mean, there is a clause in international law which says you cannot search a plane in which the head of state or leading figures of a government are flying. They are protected. But they did it. Austria. Why? Because they carried out orders. They were told to do that. And Evo Morales, when he arrived back in La Paz, said the Spanish had arrived in Austria, saying, we want to look at the plane ourselves. And he said, I told them in very robust language what they could do with themselves. He said, we couldn't, uh, you know, the Austrians had us because they had to refuel and they were, so we said, okay, go and look at the plane if you want, though we are not in favor of it, we are allowing you to do it and see what you find. They found nothing. And then five South American countries met and three of them, Venezuela, Nicaragua and Bolivia have now offered Edward Snowden asylum. And thank God these countries exist, because soon, I mean, if these regimes are removed or toppled, they will be nowhere. But just imagine what has happened. A guy has made public something which everyone should be pleased by. Instead of digesting and analyzing what he has revealed, they want to shoot the messenger. The entire media in the Western world is now carrying out this line, irresponsible. The Guardian is probably the only paper now defending him, I think. So it's becoming more and more difficult. And it's obvious why the Americans uh, want to uh, deal with him, lock him up for life. Uh, and Obama said, no, he has not uh, damaged American security. Well, that's a relief. So then why are you searching him if he's not threatening American security? America is not technically at war with anyone at the moment, except the Afghans. But if that's the case, then how can you accuse him of treason? Who has he been treasonable to? And within America itself, opinion is divided. It's interesting how the political culture in the United States has, been, has changed. I mean, just imagine if Iran had done this, captured a plane flying a, some European leader or the other and forced it to land and searched it because they thought some Iranian dissident was on board. Just imagine what the response would have been. So we live in this grotesque world of double standards, where there's one criteria when the United States does something or its allies, and a totally different criteria when states it regards as its enemies or who are not friendly at any rate do it. And it can be the same thing. Interestingly enough, the sharpest response in terms of criticism came from the Spiegel a German magazine, because in Germany, on this question of surveillance, there is sensitivity. Why? Not for any great noble reasons, but because the entire propaganda of the West German regime against the DDR, the East German government, was that the Stasi, the East German secret police, used to spy on its people. The Stasi's technology was, you know, in those days extremely weak. They did do it. But it's nothing now compared to what the United States has done. And the degree of surveillance which they do, they can go into any computer they want to where they identify something they think is not right. So in Germany, the thought of their closest ally behaving like the Stasi did awaken a few uh, uh, people and uh, the Spiegel said that it was what they are witnessing in America is a form of soft totalitarianism, which is the hardest comment, by the way, from Europe <laughs> up till now. Uh, <clears throat> and this no doubt people are shocked, 
But because of the political culture that has come into operation since 9-11 and the atmosphere of fear that has been created, that unless you let us do what we want to do, there will be more terrorist attacks on us. People have uh, become sort of numb. And in the United States, there's another problem that the bulk of the media, you know, 80% of people who work in the media support the Democrats. So they can't admit that Obama is effectively the same if you analyze his policies and what he's done and on some issues worse than Bush. They can't admit that. Had Bush done these things and they had come out now, half of America would have been crying murder. This is a betrayal of our Constitution, this, that. But because it's Obama, they don't speak up. And the result of all this is, of course, that when another Republican comes, there will be no one left to speak up because they'll say, you didn't speak up when Obama did it. And of course, we know these things started under Bush. Cheney instituted these plans for general surveillance. And there's an interesting Hollywood film called The Enemy of the, Enemy of the State. That is the NSA, by the way, the organization which targets an innocent black American lawyer, wrecks his life, uh, and then he has, you know, of course, it has to be a happy ending in Hollywood. Uh, in real life, it's not exactly the same. But the fact that they did this film some years ago showed that there was knowledge of what the NSA was up to in the United States against its own citizens. And during the Bush years, a New York Times journalist, James Risen, and his colleague, whose name I forget, got some inside information from the NSA and wrote an article saying surveillance against US citizens has reached a peak. That article was not published by the New York Times for a whole year. And when it was published, some of it was modified. And Risen was asked to give the name of his source, which he refused to do. So they didn't do anything, but he's still under threat. He could be arrested. And under Obama, the level of all this has gone up even further, just like the level of drone attacks. So when you have a unipolar world without opposition, or with very limited opposition, let's put it, let's qualify that, then the media, by and large, becomes a central pillar of the world order. And when I say the media, I'm not saying every single newspaper, that's not the case, but a significant majority of the media networks become involved in this. And if you look how the language changes, it's someone should do a study. There was a very brilliant study by a German philologist uh, whose name I'm trying to remember, who uh, was related to the great composer. It'll come back to me. And he did an, a an analysis called The Language of the Third Reich. And he wrote how living in Germany, uh, before Hitler really decided to go to war and embark on atrocities against the Jews and the Slavs and everyone else, how there had been a change in language, how certain things were not called by what they should be called by. And he gave hundreds of examples and he said and the tragedy was that even many of us on the left reading this in the newspapers day after day began to use those words without meaning them in the same sense. And if you look at the language of neoliberalism and how it's used, every neoliberal measure that defends uncritically the market, supposedly free but in fact heavily dependent on the state, the, what, what are the words used? This politician or that political leader is resisting reform. Now, the one thing neoliberalism isn't is reform. It is, in fact, regression. Regression to a world where no challenges were accepted, the early phases of capitalism. Very interesting footnote I just want to, to give you, I've remembered, which hasn't again been published. A very senior British historian was invited from Cambridge 
to give a talk to the think tank of the Chinese Politburo. And they said to him, he said, good, good, I'll be delighted to come. Can I talk to you about this? They said, no, the subject we have decided uh, for you, Professor, is to give us a talk on how Britain avoided a revolution in the 19th century. <laughs> so he went. He went and gave the talk to the Politburo think tank at which Politburo members were present, and they listened very carefully. And they said, and in the 19th century, when Europe was having revolutions every minute, Britain remained a solid, stable society which enabled it to project its industry.